Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fabio Parasecoli, and I'm an associate professor here at the New School and the coordinator of the Food Studies program. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome here um, for this afternoon discussion that it's very relevant, not only for New Yorkers, I think, but also for other metropolitan communities all over the world. Uh, and the theme will be how to connect local agriculture with urban buyers. As a matter of fact, we're taping this, we we'll put it on, on our New School YouTube channel, so it will be available also behind, uh, beyond sorry, uh, the university. Before I start introducing tonight's um, works, let me tell you a little bit about the Food Studies program here at the New School. Um, food as a subject of study, uh, and food studies as a discipline, have experienced a tremendous growth in the past few years, both in terms of academic programs and of interest among students and the general public. The new school has been at the forefront of this nationwide phenomenon. Beginning in 2008, we began offering courses in food history, culture, writing, business, policy, and many other topics. We have recruited the mix of scholars and practitioners that the new school is known for to teach our courses, and the responses have been tremendous, both from the faculty and the students. After three years, Food studies at the new school now includes courses on food history, food policy and politics, nutrition and public health, as well as uh, food in media and communication. I won't list all our classes now, but I, I encourage you to sign up to receive our catalogs to see what we're up to. Uh, we actually have a few exciting new classes for the summer, which might interest you. Um, all our food studies classes are open to the public. It's in the tradition of the new school uh, to keep this sort of connection and civic engagement with the community, so we decided to keep them all as part of our uh, continuing education program. Um, the food studies curriculum is growing and will keep on expanding in the, in the next few years, not, not only in terms of classes, but also of events like this. Actually, last month, we experimented with the first pop-up class in the Union Square Farmers Market, which was, surprisingly, I must say, covered by the New York Times and New York One. So that had a lot of resonance. Um, we organize panels, conferences, and tonight's event is organized together with two partners that are very important for us, the Edible Magazines and Grow NYC Green Market. Uh, they have already organized events at and with the new school, and our collaboration is developing and expanding, as tonight's panels show. Uh, and now, this afternoon's program. I'm very happy and honored to have such a distinguished group of scholars and food professionals with us tonight to discuss these very important issues. How do we build strong food sheds where urban buyers and close by farmers and producers can connect and thrive? How do we implement new market relationships to change food systems at the local, regional, and ultimately at the national level? The afternoon will consist of three parts. The first panel, moderated by Shana Cohen from Grow and NYC, will focus on issues of infrastructure, such as distribution, sales, wholesale. Then we'll have a, a coffee break that I hope will be a chance for you guys to talk both to the speakers and among themselves, network, many people here are actually involved in those activities. Uh, the second panel, moderated by Brian Halwell from Edible Manhattan, will examine aspects of the marketing and the communication about local agriculture. The second panel will be followed by our keynote speaker, Caroline Dimitri, now a visiting professor at New York University, who will examine the challenges and possibilities in uh, changing food systems. Uh, her talk will be followed by refreshments and a glass of local wines, allowing more time for, for you guys, for people and guests to chat and make contacts. So now let me introduce Shana, Shana Cohen, the moderator of our first panel. Shayna is Grow NYC Green Market's wholesale green market specialist, working to strategically grow New York City's only dedicated marketplace for mar farmer direct sales in wholesale quantities. She recently returned from 18 months in rural Greece as a Fulbright Fellow, where she studied the preservation, cultivation, and marketing of rare and local seed varieties. In the US, she has worked on farms in West Virginia, New York, and Rhode Island, where she co-founded and co-managed Rhode Island's first community-supported agriculture venture in the mid-90s. As a senior consultant with CARP Resources from 2003 to 2008, Shayna was a member of the Wholesale Farmers Market Feasibility Study Team 
and a project leader for NYC School Foods Local Food Procurement, work which helped bring millions of dollars of local food to school cafeterias using the school system's existing budget and distribution network. So Shayna will in turn introduce the speakers on the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm very happy to be here today and to be moderating this panel on this topic, which is always sort of at the center of my mind and my work, and to be here with these three panelists, panelists who I think will have a lot to contribute to a discussion on this. Uh, as Fabio mentioned, I have helped manage the Wholesale Green Market, which is a nighttime market in the Hunts Point Peninsula from 2 a.m. to 8 a.m., where farmers from around the region can sell in wholesale direct quantities to Wholesale buyers of all kinds, institutions, restaurants, caterers, bodegas, anyone and everyone who wants to buy wholesale. So this is a key piece of infrastructure for the city that we're looking to build into an even better, more dependable piece of infrastructure, um, an actual building um, with loading docks, perhaps cold storage and things like that, which is one of the reasons that, that I'm on this panel as well as a moderator today. I think when we talk about infrastructure and distribution, we tend to talk a lot in, in our world of direct marketing. At, at Green Market, we talk a lot about how agriculture has consolidated and how groceries have consolidated. But we tend not to talk as much about all of the infrastructure in the middle that's consolidated and how that consolidation has sort of cut out small and mid-scale farmers along the way. Um, when we talk about that, we're talking about packing lines. We're talking about processing, cutting, um, shipping, trucking, all the distribution logistics, and everything <coughs> along the way. So today what I want to do with these three panelists is get into the specifics. Where are the gaps in infrastructure and distribution in our region? How did these panelists work to fill them? And having done what they've done, what gaps do they see now? And what's next? Um, we know that the demand for local food in our region is huge. Uh, the wholesale farmers market study that Fabio mentioned when he was introducing me indicated that there's $866 million of demand, unmet demand that is, for local food from wholesale buyers only in the city. And what did they say over and over and over again when we talked to them for that research? What did they want? They wanted food that had to be, it had to go through some kind of infrastructure, not just raw food. They wanted something that was fresh cut. They wanted meats that were cut and ready to sell or use. They wanted cheeses. They wanted things that didn't just come straight out of the ground, packed however, and come to them. They wanted standard packing so that they could stack things in their coolers in a clean and, and systematic way. Um, so all of that points to a greater need for infrastructure. And infrastructure can be as simple as a walk-in cooler. It can be as complex as a facility that washes and cuts and packs and ships and does all of that along the way. Um, but what does infrastructure mean? One example of, of how big an impact a simple piece of infrastructure can have is at the Rangis uh, market, which is one of the biggest produce markets in the world, or food markets in the world, actually, not just produce, in Paris. They built a shed. No, no cooling, no climate control, just loading docks and a shed for the farmers who sell direct there. And the, mil the minute the building went up, nothing else changed, farmer sales increased by 30%. So small things can have a big impact. I think the other thing I want to talk about is um, that when we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about not just direct food, food that comes direct from farmers to us, though we think a lot about how that food and the relationships that farmers and consumers build enriches the food that we eat, there are a lot of farmers that don't have or want to use the skills that it takes to direct market food, or they grow or have a scale that, that prohibits them from selling direct, and we need this kind of infrastructure to sell their food for them. So what we want to do is think about chains that are smaller and also more purposeful. So if there are middlemen, if there are links in a chain between the farmer and the consumer, that they should be valuable links and that they should link to desirable markets for producers and through productive, sustainable businesses. Um, I guess the other thing I wanted to point out is that relationships, um, and as our, as our panelists are talking, I want them to also think more about the kinds of relationships and services and how those things can be counted as infrastructure as well. Um, finding ways to collaborate with existing infrastructure that may not work with smaller mid-scale farmers now, but perhaps with different kinds of relationships could serve those people. So a lot of this is thinking in terms of a region also, not just thinking in 100 miles, not thinking within state limits, but looking regionally and thinking about a region, how the region works. And our panelists represent a spread of work that stretches from southern Pennsylvania up through New Jersey to northern New York and all across New England, maybe even beyond. They'll tell me if I missed some. 
So without further ado, I just sort of wanted to introduce some of the concepts that I hope to touch on today. I will introduce Mary Cleaver. Mary is one of the country's foremost authorities on sustainable food and agriculture and is the president and founder of the Cleaver Company and the Green Table in Chelsea Market. The Cleaver Company is a full service event planning and catering operation with a large roster of private, nonprofit, and corporate clients and a 50 person full time staff. The Green Table Restaurant is a sustainable eatery and wine bar where guests enjoy delicious dishes that demonstrate a commitment to seasonal regional cuisine. And for more than 30 years, the Cleaver Company and the Green Table have been widely recognized for supporting a regional farm and food economy and healthy food system by utilizing local farms and purveyors in order to obtain the best quality product and supporting small to mid-sized farms and family farmers. Mary is also a founder of the Farm to Chef Network and a board member of Food Systems Network NYC and Local Infrastructure for Local Agriculture, among other professional affiliations. Whether at a gala for 500 or a dinner for two at the green table, Mary's long-standing conviction that the best foods are grown, tended, and harvested within a day's drive of your table is always clear. And that's what brings her to us today. Do you want to introduce your work? Um, well, yeah, thank you for uh, coming and for having me here, uh, Shana. Um, I, I know that distribution is a huge, uh, it's a huge concern, um, and um, I just, you know, to quote Brian Howell, who will be the next moderator, food is the solution, not the problem. So we need to start looking at, at all of what we're doing, all the work we're doing in that, in that way, I think. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm in this position just because I've been at this for a while. When I moved to New York in the late 70s, I was surprised to find that in the marketplace of, of the country and the world, you couldn't find local produce in the summer months. Um, and also, furthermore, you could find raspberries from Chile in February. So it was a sort of an astonishing um, awakening for me and, and, a, and just a puzzle that I, I just couldn't figure out. <laughs> um, uh, but the more I got it, you know, the more I learned about the food supply, and I think this, you know, I started out as a, you know, just out of college, washing dishes and then cooking, and eventually started a catering business, and now have a restaurant as well. But you know, my um, sort of arc in, in learning about food and the food supply was, uh, you know, my awareness was happening at the same time as the food supply was becoming more and more and more corrupted and becoming more distant from um, from where eaters were eating. <laughs> So the food was coming from farther and farther away from your table. Um, and green markets, uh, fortunately, uh, began at about that same time. So, um, you know, I, I've been uh, shopping at green markets since the second year. The first year was at Union Square when I discovered it. Um, and green markets did a wonderful job of um, bringing local produce into the city and has done an amazing job. and is trying to do it on, on more levels all the time. Um, and I'm a big believer and supporter in the work that they do. Um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, Shana mentioned Farm to Chef, which is a, a group that was started with a grant from New York State Ag and Markets. Um, and it was just, uh, a, began around the we first started talking about it in the fall of 2001, and that just was a conversation that I had at Green Markets with a pork producer who I met for the first time, I think the week before the Trade Towers fell. And um, it, I was very excited to see that because I had become more and more concerned about where my meat was coming from, how it was raised, how it was slaughtered, and uh, you know what my goal in the food industry and as a, as a food professional is to make sure that all the food that my clients eat not only tastes good, but has benefit to them and in, in health and benefit to our ecology and our earth and is a sustainable, uh, represents a sustainable uh, philosophy. So, um, so it was exciting to see local pork in the green market. And um, actually when the trade towers fell, the Cleaver Company became sort of a, a reverse uh, location for City Harvest, so rather than us sending food out to them, they were bringing raw product to us that needed to be turned into meals, because um, people were sending food from all over the country, actually, to to the city to try and help us feed the, feed the city um, at that time. But um, 
through the course of the year, it's sort of a long story, but through the course of the year, City Harvest then was given grants from the National Pork Board and the National Beef Board, which they then in turn gave to me to use for the work that I was doing at that time at St. Paul's, because after the, um, after that initial, uh, at the, uh, throughout the first week after the trade towers fell, there was a lot of unhealthy food being served around the city, and the health department got very concerned about it. So St. Paul's came to me and asked me if I would provide 200 meals a night for the rescue workers and the recovery workers at St. Paul's, which we were so happy to be able to do. And um, it was just a, an, an at-cost arrangement that kept my staff working because nobody wanted to have parties at that time. And um, so I took this money from the National Pork Board the, through City Harvest, and I said, well, can I use it with a small producer in upstate New York? And they said, well, I don't see why, why not, as long as it's pork. So um, I called up Jen Small uh, at Flying Pigs Farm and said, I have $3,000 for you. Can you supply me with the pork? And they really had to work on that because they were just a fledgling business at that time. Um, but it was a big help to them. And, we began talking uh, about how we could get more small producers into the marketplace of New York City. And when I went to the, I found the beef farmer who was a, a man named Mike Scannell in, in Skodak Landing. His farm is called Harrier Fields Farm. And um, I realized when I visited Mike how difficult it was, you know, when you have animals that you're feeding on grass and, and farming, you know, pretty much, you know, in a, in a very, uh, low impact way, it's very hard to get off your farm when you're raising animals. So I just became further empowered with the notion that I was the jobber. It was my responsibility to help get this food, this local food, help the producers grow their businesses by getting their product into the marketplace of New York City. We have all these eaters here in New York who need to be fed healthy, tasty, wonderful food, and we have producers who are four and five hours away. Why was it less expensive for me to get lamb from New Zealand than from four hours from New York City? I mean, these were questions that just kept coming up. How do we change this? So, um, so we, that's where Farm to Chef came in and we, um, Jen Small and the uh, Paula Schaefer, who was the Cornell Ag Extension uh, representative in Saratoga um, and Washington counties wrote a grant and we got the grant, and then we had a big meeting in the middle of February with all the producers from three counties, Rensselaer County also joined in, who wanted to be a part of it to come and, and learn about this idea that we had, that we were gonna market food directly from them to chefs in New York City. And there were people that were like, farmers like, oh, this will never work, we've tried this before, you know, and then there were others who were like, yeah, you know, let's let's give it a try. So, so that's how that, began and then we did the same thing in New York with chefs who were interested in, in sourcing locally and knowing that their food was going to come from a place where they could talk to the producer, where they could go visit the farm, where they could see what practices were in use, they could know the soil that it was coming from and, and be clear that not only was the food going to taste better but it was also going to be supporting a healthy food supply. So, um, so that's how, that's how that got started and um, uh, we ran it for five years. It was it, Well, when the grant ran out, it turned into a business and then it was run by a volunteer board of directors. Ultimately, a distribution business really needs a business person to run it. It needs to be run as a business. Um, so um, we did sell it to a businessman. Um, uh, and so anyway, it's just a big part of my work and, and my belief that we can create new infrastructure um, to to get local food, to keep our farmland in farming, and to help the producers who are really, we are all grateful to for doing the work that they do to feed us, and we need to keep that happening. Thank you, Mary. We're gonna hear from Jim Hyland next. Uh, Jim and his family moved to the Hudson Valley to become involved in the growing and growing local sustainable food movement. And in 2006, he received a $59,160 New York State FAID grant to conduct a feasibility study on creating a regional label for a line of frozen vegetable products. Winter Sun Farms started with the simple notion that wanting more local food all year long by working with small local farms to freeze their produce and then distribute it through a membership of over 1,400 in a winter CSA program. 
NYC members account for half of his membership, including schools and colleges. And the growth of Winter Sun Farms and the lack of regional food processing kitchens led Jim and his business partner to convert an old IBM cafeteria into a new 21,000 square foot processing kitchen in Kingston, New York, called Farm to Table Co-Packers. Besides producing Winter Sun Farms products, the kitchen offers co-packing services to farmers and food entrepreneurs throughout the region. So we heard from Mary a bit about the process of starting from scratch a small scale distribution business, and we can hear now from Jim about about how he went into the world of vegetable and fruit processing. Yes, and all that grant money's been spent, by the way. Um, <laughs> every penny. Yeah, every, every penny and then <laughs> some. Um, food expert, that's, um, I feel when someone says it about me, I'm like, wait, not really. I, I'm, I'm really an eating expert, I, I think. Um, six years ago, I was just as likely to be on the other side of this table. Um, we, my, me and my wife moved up to the Hudson Valley. We were very much into local food. I belong to a CSA, and I don't know, if, I'm sure I'm, some, most of you belong to CSAs or are familiar with them, but you get that big thing of kale. Um, and I had it on my kitchen counter, and I'm like, uh, okay, I don't want to, I can't eat it all, I don't want to lose it. So I, I did what you do, Google, you know, you can freeze kale. So we, we, we froze it all winter and ate it, and it was great, it was wonderful. And then talking with our farms, we found out that a lot of times they plow under kale because they don't have a, a market for it. It's not worth it for them to pick it because they have nowhere to sell it. Um, so, you know, that light bulb moment goes on, and I'm like, I know there's more people like me that would want to eat this during the winter, so let's give it a shot. And that's where the grant came in. Um, that grant money was out there. I, you know, I had no background in food whatsoever. Um, but I wrote it, and lo and behold, I got it, which was um, exciting and, and very scary at the same time. Um, and we started growing it and, and growing the business very slowly, uh, working with the farms, paying them directly. Um, and trying to understand what the farms wanted. The farms didn't want a co-op. They wanted me to pay them for their produce because first of all, they didn't really trust exactly what I was doing, so I had to prove myself a little bit. Um, and the, the next thing we saw as it was growing is that there was no infrastructure in the state. Um, as a food entrepreneur trying to do this program, trying to do Winter Sun Farms, working with local, um, local farms, we started look. We were using a small kitchen in Poughkeepsie, which was run by a non-profit, uh, which is now <clears throat> closed. Um, we had no control over it. Um, it was inadequate, and I looked around, and there was nowhere else to do what we, I wanted to do. Um, so then I had to start another company, uh, which was uh, started with my business partner Luke Rolls, who's also in a local food um, company called Pika's Farm Table, and he was helping me as a co-packer. Uh, a co-packer is a term for someone who actually does the work in the kitchen for you. So if you have your mom's or grandma's salsa recipe and you want to bring it to market, you're not going to build a kitchen to make it. Um, what you're usually going to do is try to find someone who can do it, and that's, what, that's the term co-packer. So he was my co-packer, and he'd been trying to find a place to do, um, uh, to do what he was doing. And I said, Luke, you've got to find a place or I'm going to build a place. And I didn't really want to do it myself either. And um, we found an old IBM facility in Kingston, New York, um, that's called Tech City. It had been pretty much abandoned for 15 years, the kitchen. Uh, but IBM had put a lot of money into it, stainless steel and floor drains, and it was, we basically brought it back to life. And now it's um, a production kitchen uh, where we produce the Winter Sun Farms products, the Pika's products. But as you can see, I also brought some props with me. We're also producing for farms directly. This is not even labeled. We just did this the other day. This is uh, Ken Miglarelli's tomato juice. Now, you may ask, how are we making tomato juice right now? Where did the tomatoes come from? Um, and where the tomatoes came from is um, last year, we opened in June, you know, this new facility, 21,000 square feet. We were running around, and I got a call from uh, Amy Hepworth, uh, a farmer in Milton. Jimmy, my tomato plants just blow, blew down. You know, I got two days to harvest them. What am I going to do with them? I said, I don't know. Bring them in. We'll figure something out. Um, and since we had this infrastructure, we built this infrastructure, she was able to bring in the tomatoes. We froze them. Not really sure what we are going to do with them, but we froze them in, in five-gallon buckets. And lo and behold, we got Brooklyn Salsa Company. You know, not a couple of weeks later, says, we want local tomatoes all year round when we do our production. So from that connection, which is also part of infrastructure, those relationships, um, we put up 60,000 pounds of our tomatoes. Um, and Brooklyn Salsa is using them 
you know, even now to make their salsa. And from that, the other farmers heard what we were doing. So Ken took his tomatoes and he put them in his cooler and froze them. And he, we've been thinking all winter what else to do with them and we were testing them. And he also has a great tomato sauce, a marinara sauce that we did. And, um, and we're doing the uh, tomato juice and we were able to do that too. So that's how we're using local tomatoes now. And the exciting thing for me, besides having this facility for winter sun and now winter sun can grow, um, not just the retail, the Winter Sun uh, shares, which are really important. Uh, we're going for 2,000 members this year. Um, but we also can do institutionals. We're selling 20-pound packages to colleges, um, SUNY New Paul's, Vassar, hopefully the new school and NYU. We get uh, everybody involved in it. Um, but having that infrastructure, um, you know, was a challenge. And even within our infrastructure, what we've already built, there's more that we could that we could use in order to help more farms uh, going forward. So that's how I found myself here. Um, and the infrastructure is definitely uh, an important thing to discuss. Thank you, Jim. Sure. Our next panelist is Gary Guyberson. He's been a professional chef for nearly 30 years and joined the Lawrenceville School as an executive chef in 1998, where he began to develop the school's sustainable dining program in 2003. In 2007, he founded the food service company Sustainable Fair LLC with a focus on integrating sustainable food systems. He's earned a, cert a certified executive chef designation from the American Culinary Federation and is certified by the state of New Jersey as a master composter. He's a member of Slow Food USA and a Terra Madre US delegate, a board member of Fair Food and New Jersey Farm to School, and a steering committee participant for Farm to Institute. Gary has recently been invited to join Michelle Obama's Chefs, on, Chefs Move to Schools initiative and attended the 2010 White House event for that uh, initiative. Um, you want to tell us a bit about your work? Okay, so I've got, what, about four hours? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I get up, don't get scared. <laughs> um, okay, Sustainable Fair is an environmentally responsible food system uh, company that I founded uh, out of the need. I basically am a chef by trade, as you can hear from my bio, but a, a business owner by necessity. When I wanted to do this, no one really had the systems in place to do it. I started in 2004 with the school, and it started me wanting to buy eggs off a farmer adjacent to the campus, which at the time I had worked for a large food service corporation. I won't name them. <coughs> Maybe. Um, <laughs> and they had a policy where everything was organized through their buying group, meaning that I had nothing to do with what decisions I made from where our food came from, or I had no idea where it came from. So the ability to buy these eggs um, that were local, organic, and on a uh, cherry grove farm, which is a, a pasture uh, farm which actually was doing a rotation grazing, having chickens out in the wild actually doing what they do and laying eggs, uh, was just really outside of what could be done. So with a little bit of petty cash that I was uh, able to have as a chef in a, in a unit, as they would call it, instead of a dining hall, um, I started to buy these eggs, and it really was exciting for me to be able to bring a local ingredient to the kitchens. Um, what was really scary about it was that it was totally illegal because the fact that the companies would be really bent out of shape, that the aspect of buying directly from a farmer was just unheard of. It has to go through all kinds of certification levels and insurance levels, and yeah, the you know they should be liquid <laughs> eggs, and they should be pasteurized and harmonized and put into containers and frozen, and therefore... Um, also hard to handle because they're in the original package, you know, the shell. Um, it just was really, really difficult. So um, that was like the first move that I started to make and I realized that at that time I had an opportunity with the school who believed in my purpose of trying to buy local food. Um, I started a six step approach, a holistic approach where I focused on mainly waste. You can hear that I'm a certified master of composter, I'm very proud of it. Um, that was just a real awakening for me, looking at how much waste, and, and I think if we uh, happen to hear some of the Georgetown University's speech yesterday from um, the prince who was saying that 40% statistically now of food is wasted, just that we throw it away. And it's not even going into compost and returning to our soil and improving our soil, it's basically turning to methane, going into landfills. So um, just a big holistic approach looking at waste. How do we stop all the waste and, and, and really focus on uh, creating different ways. So without going off on my waste uh, movement, procurement was really important to me. I wanted to know where farm or for where the food came from. Um, my job at that time was to go to school, write the menu basically which from ingredients I was allowed to purchase, 
and get it approved you know, through the corporate world and then go on a computer and order it. I never was exposed to really what was going on around us and meeting any of the farmers that are out there. And as a chef for that many years, it was quite embarrassing for me to not really think about that. But in that industrial edge of food, that's what you did. You just basically bought food. You didn't think about what the uh, farmers were doing or how it was they were treating the land or treating their employees or how it was distributed or how good it was. It was just you wanted to write a, a catchy menu that you thought was really good. And in that day and age, with cheap oil, food could come from everywhere and it really didn't have a price factor. So it really was an awakening for me to start to think about and meet the people who actually grew the food. Um, so the procurement was a piece. And also, when I talk about waste and procurement, when I can buy food that's packaged, an original package from the farm, and be able to give them their crates back with zero waste, it's just amazing, you know, the savings that are there and also the fact that you don't have to deal with this extra waste that is a cost. Um, all this ties together in being able to buy local <coughs> food. The other real aspect was that when I was buying packaged food that was um, processed and value added, um, you know, basically my, my chefs had no skills. They basically had to open up packages and put the food out. Now I'm asking them to really know how to wash lettuce and spinach and to identify different greens and know what to do with a turnip or how to peel a beet. Um, peel carrots. I mean, there was just never done in industrial kitchens anymore. You never thought about having a vegetable peeler or a knife in your kitchen. It was a box cutter, so you could get the industrial food out of the freezer, cut the cardboard, and put it in the oven. So there was a whole other movement of an honesty that started to happen with my staff. They really felt good about what they were doing. They had a purpose. They didn't call out anymore. They started to like what they were involved in, and they also had a, this honesty about the food. So when they prepared it, they wanted people to eat it. There was this understanding of knowing the farmer and not wanting to just overcook the broccoli, but if they were involved in the whole process of seeing it from beginning to end, they wanted the kids to eat it. So that was really important for us to, to look at the training aspect. Conservation was also key for me when I looked at this, and um, you know, just traditionally how uh, kitchens run and what they did on that end of conservation, of wasting water, wasting energy, wasting food. All this has a value that we really wanted to look at and concerned about, so we, we focused on that end of it. Um, I also wanted to make sure that we marketed properly and educated. We like to call uh, my dining halls the inconspicuous classroom because when you're there, you're learning something about where your food's coming from and also learning about the environment and understanding the whole natural eco process. The other thing that was really important was to understand the seed to table. Farmer identity of the food was really key to me. I wanted to be able to tell people where my food came from and also for them to understand that and understand that food just doesn't come out of a can or a box in a freezer, that it actually is grown by people. So uh, all those together has been the approach that I took. Now, um, I get criticized sometimes because I work in an elitist kind of school of independent schools where people with money send their children. Um, we are very fortunate that the Lawrenceville School is endowed very well where we also you know, take in a lot of uh, students that get exposed to this uh, education and the food. But uh, in general, that's the point of where it stops. When the public schools want to buy, they don't have the money to do what they need to do. So that's where my work as a volunteer comes into effect with the chef, uh, the chef to School programs and the New Jersey Farm to School program, which I sit on the board for. And I also sit on the board for Fair Food, which is an organization that started Farm to Institution. And both of these groups are in New Jersey and Philadelphia. We've been able to work with the Philadelphia School District with grants to bring local foods into their school system. Now, one of the problems that we said in the infrastructure was that we had found all these great farms. We found some people who are interested in making sure it gets into the cafeterias, but we had no way of getting it there. So out of that conversation, it took us two years, we finally realized we needed to have a distribution system. Common Market, which is the organization that was founded out of that, is a non-for-profit, and their mission is to connect local farmers and small family farms with institutions. And their success for that has been really great. They've been growing um, in the last three years from about six people they were providing to over 60. Uh, and this is continuing to grow. We're in conversations now with the University of Pennsylvania. We've been able to, and imagine this, get fresh food into hospitals. Je uh, yeah. Jefferson and to Cooper Medical Center, two very big trauma hospitals in the Philadelphia area. Um, which, you know, if we can make the connection that food is our medicine, uh, there would be some, you know, other monies available instead of the health care. But that's another whole hour I could spend on that. Um, but generally, I wanted to, um, I guess my approach today is to share some of the work I've done with Common Market, my philosophies about how do we make this happen in schools, because that's really the key. We need to change this system for our kids, the kids that don't have access to foods, and there's a lot of them. Um, Again, don't get me started on that one. Um, but basically, it's really important for me to see that the um, 
be part of kids understanding where food comes from, demanding this. And as I was pointing to in the fact that since I'm in an independent school where we have the funds and we're spending $3 a meal, wow, um, in raw and food And not cost, wasting any of it. And not wasting it. Uh, they they're have to somehow bring that down to $1.20 or in some cases 80 cents to get it into the public schools, which is possible. One of the programs that I've been, fun, uh, been able to fund with the Johnson, or Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is in Garden State on Your Plate, where we've been able to do an educational component where as a chef I meet up and team up with a farmer uh, who will bring a product in, will educate the students about that product. I recently just did polenta. Um, with a farmer who was growing corn that we were milling in New Jersey and we made polenta for the kids and they tried it and there's a big day around it in the cafeteria and they get to you know have chef day and the farmers there and they make a small video about it and it's a really good way to start to get kids uh, approaching food in a different way of thinking about where it comes from and how it tastes. Now you may say how do I get kids to you know some of the other foods we we had is beets you know how do we get them to eat beets you know raw beets or whatever. It's a very funny story with um, the fact that with the polenta, we made two varieties, one sweet, one savory. And we just challenged kids to be chefs. You know, tell us what you think. I'm working on this recipe. Which one did you like? One I topped with uh, fresh pesto, and I had a raspberry puree on the sweet one. And got the kids to, to try it. And just, even if they didn't want to try it, I'd ask them, well, which one smells better? And you know, the first thing they're smelling, and they're like, hmm. Now they're eating it. Um, with the beets, we made a soup with an orange... Uh, a little orange uh, zest to it, and the kids were looking at it, and they, they were digging the color, but as soon as I said, cheers, and went around to the tables with them, and they were cheering their friends, and they are drinking more, and can we have more, because it was a game for them. They were involved, and I said, well, how's it taste? And they're like, this is really good. So, you know, the, to say that kids won't eat this is, is wrong. They will. They just have to be um, yeah. educated in the fact that, about that, and I'm very happy to be here, and I hope I can share some more of the work that I've been working on with the farm school initiatives and trying to change the way we feed our youth. Thank you. So I don't know how we're doing on time. We're doing okay? Great. Um, then I'll pose a question, maybe a couple of questions to the panel and then open up the floor if anybody has any questions for them. You all kind of addressed the issue of infrastructure and just in infrastructural solutions of growing local, the local food movement and local food access from niche to mainstream. Uh, and you all run mission-driven businesses, essentially. And so when you're going from small scale to a larger scale, I wanted to hear from you sort of what are, what are some of the challenges that you face in, in growing that, in growing infrastructure to do that while maintaining, keeping your mission as central to your business while being profitable in, in the food industry, which is a very small margins industry for businesses, as I think we all know. And, and on that same topic, what do, you, what do you see as the limits of scale for the infrastructure that you've been a part of building? Um, you know, how far would you like to see it go? And, and what do you think is an appropriate scale for the distribution company, for the processing company, for the reach that you've created? And anyone can chime in if they want to. Um, I'll start, like, the, the challenges, um, I mean, I look at what I've done as, as a business. So, for me, people ask me sometimes if I'm a nonprofit, and I'll say, no, no, I'm, I'm a profit business. Cause, and I want to make that distinction because I think it's really important that if you're going to make a regional food system to have businesses that profit off farms. I mean, otherwise it's not going to work. So I'm a for-profit business, and, you know, I don't care what you're doing, it's all the same problems. You know, capital, uh, planning, um, um, all those all those things that come in that come into play also come into play for us. We've had some great help from um, Hudson Valley Agro Business Development Corp, um, long name but good group um, that has you know got experts for us to, to come in when we needed it. Um, and they're a nonprofit, which is good. They're a nonprofit helping a profit company. Um, so any kind of any kind of thing uh, that a regular business would have, we, we also we also see those problems. I'll jump in then. Um, you know, s some of the barriers. Uh, is anyone familiar with the CAVE organization? C-A-B-E? Citizens Against Virtually Everything? <laughs> um, that, that is probably one of the biggest pushes in schools. You have some parents who just are not educated about it, don't care, and will continue. And, and in some cases, you know, as, as we've evolved into this food system, it's been about convenience. No one wants to be inconvenienced about what they do. So that kind of parlays into some of the institutional aspects of value added. Um, when I was able to try to make connections with farmers and schools, 
Well, they can't really reinvent some of the things they do. Some of them don't have kitchens in general. So there's this value added needed process where we need to be able to get this food from the farms, have it, and, and sort of the work that you've been trying to accomplish now, into institutional packing sizes so that they don't have to deal with some of the heavier labor issues about doing this food. Um, the, the other thing that I think is important um, is building this awareness so that there is also an educational component that is really important that people understand the value of the nutrition of this food and how fresh it is versus the, um, the, the, some of the processing that's going on in the food that's being shipped so far away. So I think it's important for us, and as I use the common market as an example, because we actually started this um, company as a not-for-profit off of grants, I feel the same way as, as my co-panelists here, that it has to be a for-profit situation, and that's our goal for this nonprofit is to turn it into a for-profit organization because of the fact that it won't continue on if it has to be supported by grant programs. So that's a real uh, a struggle for us, is finding the money to make sure that the business is a, is a sustainable business to be able to provide the services that are needed. Yeah, I, and I would just agree that education is a huge part of the of what needs to happen on every level, um, with beginning with our youngest children and, and our oldest citizens and everywhere in between, that it needs to be a full court press in uh, an education and re-education. I think we have a tremendous amount of food illiteracy in our, uh, in our uh, population and um, we have a kind of understanding that whatever uh, we eat, that food is healthy and I think that we really need to educate our population that much of the food that we eat is poison, and um, that they need to, you know, we need to relearn uh, what healthy food is, and um, and also that there is a, a tremendous amount of waste in our food supply. It is so true. I mean, I've been working with Bill Telepan's program, Wellness in the Schools. So as I wanted to get inside the public school system in New York and see what really happens in the in the classroom, in the in the cafeteria. And you know, the they have a dollar, okay, but they the wall of the school cafeteria that I've been working in, which is in Windsor Terrace, is lined with bundles and bundles of styrofoam trays that are wrapped in plastic. And the kids are given um, a spork every day that comes in a plastic container. It's a plastic spork in a plastic container. So just from the get-go, before the food even hits their tray, there's this waste created. And then they're offered many different choices, and they can't eat it all, they're little kids. And it ends up in the garbage at the end of the lunch uh, time. And so I think that there's, you know, we have a lot of reassessment. You know, we don't, there, there doesn't need to be a choice of four different entrees in school lunch. Um, I don't know how you feel about that, but. I definitely think that we, we have issues with what we require to be on a tray and yeah. what we call food yeah, yeah. and what, what a uh, exchange and that, means. Yeah, and that the, um, that the edible schoolyard programs and putting gardens in our schools and teaching kids how to grow food is a very important part of helping them learn how to eat good food. So. Could I? Go ahead. <laughs> the second part of your question, though, I want to answer, too, about the scaling up. Um, a lot of times I get the question, you know, people come see our facility, it's 21,000 square feet, it's pretty big um, for me, and they'll come in and say, well, okay, well, how much can you do? You know, what's your, what's your limits here? I'm like, you haven't placed one order with us yet. Why are you so worried about what I can do? Why don't you just start ordering and then we, we can go from there and we can grow it as we go. I'm, I'm probably one of the few people that whenever I do these talks and the distribution comes up, I'm always like, I'm not really that worried about distribution. There's, there's, la there's maybe lack of trucks, but I'll tell you one thing. If NYU and the new school is going to buy you know, 10,000 worth of product from me, we'll get a truck there. You know, a truck, someone's going to come up and make that business, or we're going to figure out how to do it. That's going to happen. So that doesn't, that doesn't scare me. Um, so the whole, I don't like looking at it like, okay, well, what can you do? Let, let's get there. Let's take our time. There was a study that said that if, um, if all the uh, acreage in New York State was put into farming right away, we could only feed 65% of all our needs. I'm like, why? What are you talking about? Let's just start doing it, and we'll see where we get there. And we'll worry about that when we're at sixty-five percent and our farms are our max. Let's you know, let's start worrying about where we're going from there. So scaling up, I think you know, I think we, there's there's no limit until we hit it, and we're far from it. Agreed. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Agreed. Yeah. I want to open the floor up. Could, could I just, I wanted to try to do something real quick. Could, by show of hands, could I just um, get a feel for the audience? Uh, if anyone is in food production or a chef, raise their hand. Farmer? Distribution? Education? Eaters? <laughs> is there anyone from the cave organization here? Um, the reason I say that is one of the key things, and, and I'm sure my panelists will agree, a lot of times we're asked to speak, and it's always just a, a narrow focus of the group we're talking to. And what uh, took place for us when we really felt that we had some momentum with the New Jersey Farm School Movement was that we were able to hold a conference that we um, put farmers, distributors, packers, aggregators, food service companies, and the Department of Agriculture and the government involved in it. So we had all the right players in the right room where we ended up, at the end of the day, really making progress because we can take all these ideas we talk about today and we'll all agree upon it and preach to the choir about it, but you know, if the farmers are not here and the packers and distributors and the people who want to buy it and the state don't understand this, then, then that's where we're missing. And I think there should be more effort for us to not um, leave empty spots at the table. Absolutely, and in my work with school food in New York City, I've definitely found that facilitating communication across these sectors of the food industry that depend on each other so intensively but don't always communicate is, is a really key part of missing infrastructure, I think, in, in the regional food system and getting local and regional food into the city. You had a question? Yes. Um. Thanks. Uh, hi. <laughs> my name's uh, Alyssa Roth. I'm the um, Bronx Marketing Outreach Coordinator for NYSERDA, which is the New York State uh, Energy Authority. And I have a question for Jim and Gary. Um, you both started out uh, with grants and have transitioned to be for-profit companies. And I was wondering if you could talk a little, about, uh, a little bit about the transition from nonprofit to for-profit. Uh, when's the right time to do that? And what were the steps that you had to take? I wasn't. I foreclosed on my house and just started my company. OK. <laughs> Actually, I still own my house. So I, I didn't get a grant. I, uh, I was funded. and. Um, use my own resources and, and put my company together. Okay. Um, I got the grant, uh, it was a Grow New York City grant, a Grow New York State grant. Um, it was for a feasibility study. So all I needed to do at the end of that was to hand in a piece of paper or a report showing the feasibility of it. Um, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, so I did hand in the feasibility, you know, it, that was done, but I really took it as seed money. Um, and from there, just kind of started from there. Um, and then when we started the new company, which needed a lot more capital than the $60,000, um, that was when the house goes on the line. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we haven't seen too much grant money um, from, what we were, you know, from what we're doing at, at the next step. But the grant money gave us um, enough information hopefully, that you know, we made the right choice when the more bigger capital was needed. I think, you know, to answer your question, maybe in reference to why you're asking me, it was about the common market who started as a nonprofit and still is. They have a very good board that's structuring them to become a for-profit. So a lot of the initial investments that the grants money was used for was for the distribution, the trucks and mm -hmm. space, and then just the systems in itself. They've, I would recommend anyone to go online and take a look at what they've been able to accomplish and see their growing list of uh, products and farmers that they deal with. And uh, Gary doesn't even know this, but um, Common Market's carrying Winter Sun Farm stuff. Yes. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> and that was a relationship that just you know, happened. And that's when I'm talking about the product, the demand, the distributor. You know, he was there, or they were there. Farm to Chef, which Mary was involved in, transitioned from grant to business, so perhaps we could address that yeah. question. Yeah, um, so that was um, when the grant ran out, it was a uh, corporation, a C Corp was formed. Um, there were, um, <coughs> we raised uh, $12,000 with various investors, so it was started with very, very low, um, uh, low capitalization, so minimal capitalization. Um, which actually was a problem for the organization eventually. So it needed more capitalization to, to succeed, um, which is why we then, and, and because we had um, very little, we wanted to really support the producers. So um, 
many distribution companies charge 30% plus for, for of, of the product to support the distribution process. Ours was 20, so it over time it wasn't enough. So they're there. Um, but I'm I mean running a business with values. This is a capitalist society. There's no reason why we can't have businesses run with values, and I think that part of the education that needs to go on as well. <laughs> Um, hi. My name is Rihanna. I work uh, for a New York City Council member, and I've done a lot of work in the schools. And so my question is, um, in keeping with that, you know, things can't go on forever with grants and sort of nonprofit funding. Um, in New York City, we have this great, amazing culture of so many school, you know, grant organizations or nonprofits that are doing little projects and doing pilots. And they do amazing work, but I feel like the focus is is still not on the bigger policy issues, and it's part of what we're trying to focus on in the council office I work at, and I'm wondering how, you know, how can we sort of build that communication and that awareness that even if we're going to do these great programs like Wellness or Garden a Cafe or Fresh Fruit and Vegetable, which are all expanding this year, how can we do them with the end goal being, let's do them to encourage the demand for fresh local products and to encourage policy change, which is, you know, sustainable and not funding dependent. Well, I, I just like to say I think it is really a big part of our of the responsibility of our elected officials to really make this happen. Um, you know, it is Governor Patterson signed into law. It's I, what's the percentage of I don't remember the number, but of uh, fifty percent or more of of food sourced and served in lo in our institutions in New York State have to be sourced from New York State. So if we even have these laws, so they just need they need to be put into practice, and that's that's where the infrastructure question comes in. Like, how do we get those potatoes from Washington County into the public school system in New York City? I mean, it is uh, it it is it is part of the problem. How do we get our you know how do we how do we slaughter pigs and lambs in in the Hudson Valley so that they can <coughs> We can, producers can produce more because we have the infrastructure to process them. So these are all, you know, we need to redirect our thinking towards food safety, towards food supply, towards, and I think we need to elect officials who have this on their mind that we are, it's important. I just feel we need more funding. Um, that's part of the problem too because it's going to uh, be bidded out. A lot of this is specifications and what they can yeah. afford. So uh, we, we to speak to more about New Jersey, the, the laws there are quite different, not quite different, but as I try to take my company into a public school, I'm given the quotation in the RFP to fill out and I do my work and I come in at $2.86. Well, there's frozen food companies that can come out and say we'll do it for two eighty or even a penny less and it's law that they win the bid as long as they meet the nutritional guidelines. Well, my food that I'm bidding on is much different than the food that they're calling food. So therefore, the state and the government has these uh, requirements that have to be met, and as long as they do that, they win the bid, and it's over. There's, even if I could guarantee them a better, fresher, local product, I can't do it if I'm not below the, low, uh, the lowest bidder. Right. It's not apples to apples, though. I no, mean, the food that the one, some of the food is alive and some of the food is dead. So the dead food costs less, you know. And not just that, some of the fresher food also, when it gets into the kitchen, going back to this issue of waste, which came up over and over again, um, fresher food that makes it into the kitchen has a longer shelf life, which means there will be less waste. You have more opportunities to use it, even within a set and planned menu that has limited to no flexibility, which school meal menus often right, but have. There are no kitchen. I mean, some of the schools don't have kitchens. I mean, they, right, at most. PS 130, they had a couple of cases of bananas that were really you know, a little bit overripe. And I said, let's make them into banana bread. <laughs> you know, well, you have to, they don't have flour on their procurement list at that school. I mean. All right, the, there is a lot of uh, stuff coming up also. Uh, so we'll take the first break. Of course, the conversation can continue around coffee. Uh, we're all being here. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> please. There is some coffee, some water. Yeah, I know. Help yourself.